Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and continue reading Keeper of the Lost Cities, Sitter, Sitter, <laughs> Keeper of the Lost Cities by Shannon Messenger. We are on chapter 22. Sharing a room with Iggy was kind of like having a congested warthog for a roommate, but Sophie didn't mind. She was warm and snuggly with the feeling of home, and even a sleepless night couldn't spoil it. Grady and Adeline promised to check on Iggy during the day to make sure he was okay, and Sophie left for Foxfire, not even caring that it was a Thursday, and she had another humiliating PE session ahead of her. Who's ready for the ultimate splotching championship? Sir Caton, 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 asked as the the mentors strode into the amphitheater carrying huge sacks of tiny brightly colored balls <clears throat> everyone cheered what's the ultimate splotch splotching championship sophie asked dex telekinesis i suck at telekinesis she tried to look sympathetic, but secretly she was celebrating, finally, something she knew how to do. Well, sort of, but that was better than nothing. How does this work? She asked as everyone partnered up. Naturally, she teamed with Dex. We push the splotcher at each other with our minds, and whoever gets splattered loses. The winners play each other until there's only one left, and that person wins. Everyone on your marks? Get set. Dex tossed the splotcher toward Sophie. Catch. It very nearly splattered the floor, but at the last second, she managed to catch it with her mind. Sorry, I forgot you're worse at this than me. At least I'll win one match this time. <laughs> she rolled her eyes. He couldn't count her out yet. She took a deep breath, focusing on the power she knew was deep within her core. She was almost feeling it swirling around like a warm buzzing in her stomach. Splatch! Sophie pushed the warmth out through her fingers and sent it toward the splotcher. Splat! A stunned Dex stared at Sophie with bright pink slime running down his chin. <laughs> she nailed him right on his smug little grin. <laughs> you go, girl. <clears throat> Sorry, she said, not quite able to hide the smile in her corner in the corners of her mouth. It's okay. I guess I deserved it. Well done, Sophie, Sir Catton interrupted, so sounding more surprised than she would have liked. Go ahead and move up to the winners. Dex can join those colorful prodigies over there. <laughs> so what's the prize for this contest anyway? Sophie asked before Dex wandered away. Usually I pardon from one punishment, but don't get your hopes up. Fitz always wins. Not that Wonder Boy ever does anything to need a pardon. Anyway, I hope you win a few more rounds. Thanks. Morella made it to the winners. So did Bayana and Maruka. Even Jensi. Unfortunately, so did Steina. <laughs> you really hate Steina. Ugh. Even a uh, muskog... Musk could beat Dex, Stein and Steer sneered. Let's see how you do against a real opponent. She tossed a bright blue splotcher at Sophie's head. Sophie caught it with her mind, floating it in the space between them. She ignored the knots in her stomach. She wasn't backing down. I'm going to enjoy this, Stein sneered. I'll aim for your eyes. Finally, turn them blue. <laughs> She's mean. Sophie gritted her teeth. She didn't care how she did it, but Steiner was going down. Get set, Sir Catton called. Splotch! <clears throat> Sophie threw her hands out, pulling a bigger burst of strength from her gut as she shoved the splotcher. Splat! Ow! Steiner screamed, rubbing her slimy blue cheek. Sorry, <laughs> Sophie said, her eyes wide. Had she pushed too hard? No reason to apologize, Lady... Alexine, Alexine corrected. Well done, Sophie. I haven't seen such raw telekinetic power in a long time. Sophie flushed. That was the first compliment Lady Alexine had ever given her. But she hurt me, Stein argued. That disqualifies her, doesn't it? I didn't mean, Sophie started to explain, but Lady Alexine held up her hands. 
You didn't do anything wrong. If you're hurt, Miss Hex, go to the healing center. Either way, Sophie won fair and square. Morella caught her eye and pumped her arms in victory. Sophie's face felt hotter, especially when she noticed the other prodigies cheering for her. Did they think she'd actually taken Steina down? As for you, Miss Foster, Lady Alexine added, I think it might be a good idea to put you with the level threes so your opponents can match your mental strength. Since when did she have the mental strength to face off against older kids with a lot more training and experience? She'd been ahead around humans, of course, but here she felt so far behind it wasn't even funny. Was she starting to catch up? It seemed like she was. She took out the level threes in duel after duel, and before she knew what was happening, there were only nine other prodigies left. A level two making it to the top ten, he said behind her. He flashed a crooked, crooked smile, and you said you weren't mysterious. She stared at her feet to hide her blush. Must be beginner's luck. Keith snorted. Or maybe you've got all kinds of talents we don't know about. He couldn't know about her telepathy, could he? Look who went pale again. Interesting, he murmured. She opened her mouth to make some excuse, but he cut her off. I have a feeling you'll be the one to take down the mighty fits. Sophie froze. She wasn't surprised that Fitz was still in the competition, especially after Dex's earlier grumblings. But it hadn't occurred to her that she might have to battle him. Her palms slicked with sweat, but she shook the idea away. What were the odds she would be able to beat a bunch of older, much more experienced prodigies? Evidently, the odds were good. Soon enough, she was in the final four, her fits and two level sixes named Trella and Dempsey. Everyone seemed a, as surprised as she was, even the mentors. <clears throat> the Sir Catton paired Fitz against Trella, and Sophie toyed with the idea of not even trying in her match with Dempsey so she wouldn't have to face Fitz. Then she caught the hopeful look on Steiner's face and found a new determination to win. Splotch! Dempsey was fast on the draw, and the splotcher was halfway to her face before she stopped it. She locked her jaw and threw out her hands, pushing with every bit of strength she could muster. Her stomach cramped, and the splotcher splattered so hard it knocked Dempsey back a step. That hurt! He rubbed his cheek, smearing the orange goo. Sorry, are you okay? He flinched, not looking happy to have the girl who just bested him trying to help him. Sophie... <clears throat> stepped back. Winner! Lady Alexine announced, and Sophie spun around. Fitz waved to the cheering crowd before he turned and met her eyes. Her heart fluttered. It appears we've reached our final battle, Sir Catton announced. I think it's safe to say that this is the most unusual match we've had in Foxfire history. Are the competitors ready? Fitz stepped towards Sophie with a smug smile. I am. Uh, me too. Her voice shook, betraying her nerves. Go, Fitz! Biona shouted. Her voice had an edge that made Sophie wonder if Biona wanted her to lose more than she wanted her brother to win. She wouldn't be surprised. Kick his butt, Sophie! Keith cheered. It's about time someone took Fitz down. Some best friend you are, Fitz shouted, but he said it with a smile. Any preference on splotcher color? Sir Catton asked. Pink, 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 make Fitz look pretty in pink. <laughs> Everyone joined Keith's chant. Sophie glanced at Fitz, trying to read his expression. He grinned, lady's choice, pink. She decided to make Keith happy. And it would be fu kind of funny to splat him with pink. Not that she expected to win. Dex said Fitz always won. Pink it is. Sir Catton tossed the splatter, and Sophie and Fitz made it float in the, s in the space between them. On your marks. Sophie's hands as clenched into fists. It was, if it, if she was going to beat Fitz, she was going to have to give it everything she had, and then some. Adrenaline surged through her veins. The murmur of the audience faded, and she became aware of another buzzing in the back of her mind, like a backup pool of energy she had never noticed before. It felt stronger than the other energy. Could she draw from their in? from there instead. Get set. Splotch. Sophie threw her hands out, pushing toward the splotcher with her mind. Her brain seemed to stretch like someone snapping a rubber band, and her ears rang. 
but she didn't break her concentration. The splotches exploded as her, her force met Fitz's, and Sophie felt the energy rebound. The next thing she knew, she was flying backward across the room. She caught the surprised look in Fitz's eyes as the same phenomenon happened to him. For a long second, she was weightless. Then her back collided with the wall, and the wind was knocked out of her. An almost simultaneous crash told her Fitz had met the same fate. Pain shot through her whole body, and she collapsed. The last thing she saw was Fitz crumpled on the floor. Then everything went black. Chapter 23 Welcome back, Ellen said, placing a cool compress across her forehead. You know, for a girl who hates doctors, you sure can't seem to stay away from the healing center. She pulled herself into a sitting position, wincing as pain whipped through her through every muscle. Easy there. You've been out nearly ten minutes. Ellen flashed an orb of yellow light around her and put on his glasses. Ten minutes? What happened? No idea. I've never heard of anyone getting seriously injured while splotching. Leave it to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Poor Zoe. <laughs> where's, where's Fitz? Is he okay? He's fine. He's unconscious? He'll come around any minute. Where my wolf He mumbled, closing his eyes. <laughs> Ellen chuckled. Must have been some splashing match. Will he be okay? Of course. He, If he weren't, Bullhorn would be freaking out right now, or worse, laying next to him. He pointed to the slinky gray creature curled up in the corner. Banshees can sense when someone's in mortal danger. Fitz hit his head a little harder than you, so he needs another minute for the medicine to set in. <laughs> this is... <laughs> oh, God, sorry. That part was just hilarious. <laughs> this is all my fault, Sophie groaned. She wasn't sure if that was true, but it seemed like the most likely option. What did you do during the match? Elwin asked. I don't know. Fitz stirred, and he looked more lucid when he opened his eyes. How are you feeling? Elwin asked him. I've been better, but I'll live. Fitz winced as he sat up. Are you okay? He asked Sophie, rubbing the back of his head. She nodded, feeling shy. She hadn't really talked to him since the first day of school. Ellen handed them each a blue vial. This will ease the pain. You'll still be stiff tomorrow, but I can't help that. The glance behind her tongue seemed as Sophie swallowed the sour medicine. But the ache at her back vanished. Do either of you remember what happened? Not really, Fitz admitted. <laughs> Excuse me. I remember pushing towards a splotcher, but then it was like it rebounded or something. Rebounded? Yeah, I felt my force hit hers and bounce back at me. That's what I felt too, Sophie agreed. Ellen's eyes widened. Then he shook his head. Ah, uh, couldn't be. Couldn't be what? Sophie asked with a horrible feeling he was going to tell her it was all it really was her fault. That sounds like what happens when someone does a brain push, using mental energy for telekinesis instead of pure energy. But a brain push is a highly specialized skill only the ancients can pull off. Sophie's heart hammered in her ears. She had pulled energy from her mind in the match. Was that a brain push? Doesn't telekinesis always use mental energy? It uses mental control. Your concentration controls how you use the energy, where you send it, how much you send, but the actual energy and strength comes from your core. Don't you feel the pull in your gut when you draw on it? She did. But why would a brain push us, send us flying across the room? Mental energy doesn't mix with core energy, so they rebound. That match... That matched what she'd felt, but how could that be? Is it something you could do by accident? No way. It's a less draining way to move things. But it takes years and years to train your mind to store energy like that. Then it takes a lifetime of practice to use that mental power. It must just be that you and Fitz were evenly matched, which is still weird, don't get me wrong. You're awfully young to have that kind of strength, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. Sophie. Fitz, on the other hand, might want to worry about being beat by a level two. <laughs> Ellen laughed, and Sophie's face caught fire. 
She was too afraid to look at Fitz to see if the teasing bothered him. Plus, she couldn't help wondering if Ellen was wrong. If she'd done a per brain push, excuse me, if she had done a brain push, but what she'd done had been almost effortless. If it was a brain push, wouldn't she have had to try a lot harder? You two are clear to return to session, Ellen announced, interrupting her thoughts. But I want you to sit on the sidelines and take it easy for the rest of the day. Thanks, Ellen. Fitz stood on shaky legs, leaning on the bed for a second. Sophie jumped up, wobbling as the blood rushed through her head. Take it easy, Ellen repeated as they made their way to the door. Oh, and Sophie? He grinned when she met his eyes. I'm sure I'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah, this is Sophie. Fitz stayed quiet as they walked back to the auditorium. Sophie bit her lip. Was he mad at her? She just worked up the courage to ask him when they reached the amphitheater, and a round of applause drowned out the question. Yes, yes, welcome back, Fitz and Sophie. Glad to see you're feeling better, Sir Catton said, looking a teensy bit annoyed by the interruption. He tried to call everyone back to order, but Dax, Mar Marella, Bayona, and Keith broke rank and rushed over to them. Bayona got there first and threw her arms around Fitz, hugging him so tight he winced. It would have been a touching moment if Keith hadn't copied her and grabbed Fitz, pretending to cry. <laughs> Fitz shoved them both away, blushing. Beat by a level two, <laughs> Keith said, elbowing Fitz in the ribs. It was a tie, Sophie protested. Keith snorted. Please, you totally kicked his butt. <laughs> totally, Dex agreed. He hit the wall way harder than you did. That was the greatest present you could have ever given me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> This is great. <laughs> I'm actually enjoying rereading this. Sophie shook her head. He was hopeless. Even the mentors declared you the winner, Keith added, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. If you don't think you'll need your pardon, I'll be happy to take it off your hands. Keith, Dex, Morella, Bayona, need I remind you that you are not excused from this lesson? Sir Catton yelled. Think about it, Keith said, then ran to re rejoin the class. Fitz sat next to Sophie on the sidelines, watching everyone practice telekinesis with the remaining splotchers. She tried not to worry, but she couldn't help glancing at him from the corner of her eye, wondering why he still hadn't said anything to her. Why aren't you and Bayana friends? He asked after a minute. It seems like you guys would get along. You have a lot in common. She wasn't sure she wanted to have, the, have things in common with someone who acted like such a brat. I don't think she has time for another friend. She's always busy with Maruka. He frowned. Before she could think of anything else to say, Lady Alexine delivered her prize, a small golden square with an intricate P etched on the top. Any level two who holds her own against Fitz is the clear winner. Congratulations, Sophie. Thank you. She peeked at Fitz to see if he looked bothered. He grinned. I couldn't agree more. But his smile faded after Lady Alexine left. You really don't know what happened during the match. I don't know. I do remember pushing some energy from in mind, she whispered, afraid to look at him. But that couldn't have been a brain push, could it? Fitz had no idea how much she needed to needed him to tell her that it couldn't. Instead, he said, I'll have to ask my dad. She tried to smile, but she couldn't help feeling like she'd somehow done something wrong. The worry in Fitz's eyes it seemed to confirm her fears. So later that afternoon, she worked up the courage to ask Grady about brain pushes while she helped him give Bertie a bath. Why? He wanted to know. Sophie focused on lathering Bertie's feathers as she told him what had happened in P.E. Grady and Adeline knew about her telepathy and her silent mind, but she hated reminding them how different she really was. Who'd want to adopt a freak as their daughter? Aw, Sophie. You're not a freak. She's not a freak. She tugged out three loose eyelashes before he finally spoke. I would love to have those powers. That would be awesome. That does sound like a brain push. His voice was a whisper. When you were around humans, did someone train you how to do to use your abilities? No one knew about my abilities. Not even my parents. Why? If I can turn the page here. Bertie stirred, getting annoyed with her distracted bathers. 
happen. Brady waited until the soggy dinosaur had settled before he answered. The way you use your mind, Sophie. Someone had to teach you. It's not possible that you just instinctively know these skills. But no one taught me anything. I'd remember that. Would you? How could she not? Besides, how would a human even know how to teach me to use my abilities? It's not like they can do what we can. Grady stared in the distance. No, you're right. Only an elf could teach you. And the first elf I met was Fitz. She added, reminding him as much as herself. She didn't like the worry lines that creased his forehead. She couldn't have met an elf without knowing it, could she? No, she'd never met anyone else with a silent mind, except for that jogger that day, but she'd barely talked to him for five minutes. He couldn't have done something to her, could he? Wouldn't she have felt something? And why would he do that? Plus, Vitz said they'd been looking for her for 12 years. Even the council didn't know where she was. There was no way she could have met any other elves. But if humans didn't teach her and elves didn't teach her, who did? She searched her memories for the rest of the night, but when she went to bed, she was no closer to the, to the solution. So many things about her past raised more questions than they did answers. It was enough to drive her crazy. She had to let this go. She had enough to worry about with her adoption in Bronte and gaining the council's permission to stay at Foxfire. Once she had her future settled, she could search her past. Until then, she tried to put it out of her mind. Chapter 24 Good morning, prodigies, Dame Alina cooed during orientation the next morning. Everyone ready for another exciting day? Hey, check it out. Dex whispered to Sophie. He pointed to the meter on his plain blue nexus. I finally passed the halfway point. Really? She tried to be excited for him, but she hadn't even reached the one-third point. Yep. Not much further till I can have my own pathfinder. Maybe I'll even get my nexus off younger than... than Fitz. Man, that'd be awesome. I'd love to see Wonder Boy's face if a Disney broke his precious record. She was about to defend Fitz when Dame Alina caught her attention. We are now four weeks away from midterms. For those of you worried you won't be able to score the required 75% to pass, I recommend seeing Lady Nisa in the tutoring center. Maybe you should sign up for alchemy tutoring, Morella whispered. I'm not sure you'll pass without it. Morella's tone was teasing, but her words hit a nerve. Sophie was barely scraping by in alchemy, and that was with Lady Galvin shouting instructions across the room. <laughs> she couldn't imagine how hard it would be on her own, and she had Bronte to consider. He was probably waiting for her to fail her midterms. Everything in her shrank at the idea of meeting a tutor. She wasn't used to struggling with her grades. It felt so humiliating. Not as humiliating as getting expelled. That's it for today. Everyone work hard. Dame Alina finished, tossing her hair before her projection disappeared. Ugh, what is that? Sophie gagged and glared at the silver strip on her locker. Dex looked a little green. I think it's reek rod. Owen must have picked the flavor today. Remind me to yell at him the next time I see him. Planning another visit to the healing center? Morella asked. Going to make it a, da a, da a daily habit? Very funny. Morella gave her locker the tiniest lick and shrugged. He's done worse. Yeah, well, I'm taking all my books with me now, Sophie said. Ooh, smart thing. Smart thinking, Dex agreed, reaching for the rest of his books. He grabbed a small silver box and tore it open. Here, take a prattle to get rid of the taste. For once, Dex had good taste in candy. It was sweet and chewy, like caramel mixed with peanut butter and filled with cream. Which pen did you get? Morella asked as he pulled out a small velvet pouch like a Cracker Jack prize. Dex removed a tiny silver horse with a glittering block, black mane. <clears throat> Morella gasped. A Prattles unicorn? Please tell me you want to trade. Maybe. His eyes darted to Sophie. Unless you want it. I don't have any to trade. Morella's eyes stretched as wide as they would go. You don't have any Prattles pins? Sophie stared at her feet, hating how out of touch she... Nerve. Sophie stared at her feet, hating how out of touch she still was. 
I think Sophie should have it. Dex placed the pin in her hand before she could argue. Merlella snorted, of course you do. What? She needs to start her collection. Whatever you say. Dex blushed and Sophie pretended not to notice. She examined the little horse, amazed by the detail. The back had a tiny digital screen that read number 122 of 185. What's the number mean? There's one pin for every creature alive on the planet that we know of. Right now, there are only 185 unicorns, so that pin is super rare. Obvious bitterness leaked into Morella's voice. Hey, Sophie. A vaguely familiar voice asked behind her, Can I talk to you? Sophie spun around and froze when she saw Bionna. Uh, sure, she said as her brain struggled to compute this unexpected development. Bionna glanced at Dex and Morella. Can we go somewhere more private? Sophie hesitated half a second, then shrugged for her friends and followed Bionna toward a deserted corner of the atrium. Um, what's up? I was wondering if you wanted to come over after school today. Sophie waited for the punchline, but Bionna seemed serious. Why? Bionna looked at her hands, twisting her fingers together. I don't know. I thought it might be nice if we could try to be friends. The last words came out barely louder than a whisper. Friends? The word sounded like a foreign language coming from Bayana. Her eyes narrowed. Did Fitz put you up to this? No. Why would Fitz care if... She took a deep breath. He didn't put me up to this. But I thought you didn't like me. I never said that. You didn't have to. It was pretty obvious. Well, I'm sorry you felt that way. I guess I'm not good at meeting new people. Talk about the understatement of the century. Sophie had half a mind to tell her that she didn't need her too little, too late olive branch, but she was Fitz's sister. It would be easier if they could get along. Fine. Really? Sure, I guess it's worth a try. They both stood there, not quite meeting each other's eyes. So, what time should I come over? Sophie eventually asked. Um, why don't you go home and change and come over after that? You know how to get there, right? Yeah, I have been there before. A bit of the old glare flared in Bionna's face, but it was quickly replaced with an uncomfortable smile. Well, good. I guess I'll see you then. Sophie watched Bionna walk away, replaying the conversation in her mind, trying to make sense of it. Are you going to tell us what that was all about? Dex asked already at her side. He and Morella must have made a beeline the second Bionna's back was turned. She invited me to come over after school today. What? They asked, immediate, uh, asked simultaneously. She said she wanted to be friends. Why? They both asked. Uh, Sophie shrugged. She didn't say. Please tell me you told her to go sniff a clue on. <laughs> Dex begged. Sophie looked down, unable to meet his eyes. Oh, come on. I didn't know what else to say. You could have told her she's a stuck-up snob and you don't want to be her friend, Morello offered. Look, I know you guys aren't going to like this, but my life would be a lot easier if Bayana and I got along. If it doesn't work out, then I wasted one afternoon of my life. So what? How do you know this isn't a trap? Morella asks. Invite you over, then humiliate you. You could be walking into an ambush. That's not what this is. What? You think she's she isn't capable? Dex sneered. No, but she would never do it out of her house. Not with Fitz there. Right. I forgot. You and Wonder Boy are friends. Sophie blew out her breath. Aren't you guys the teeniest bit curious what she's up to? What are you doing, honey? Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> if you know you're loved. I hope you know you're loved. Who are you? You're loved. She had them there. I want details later, Morella agreed, and you'd better not leave anything out, Dex added. Chapter 25 Hey, Bionna said as she opened the gates of Everglen to let Sophie in. You made it. Yeah, Sophie managed a smile, a half smile. Despite her earlier enthusiasm, she was having second thoughts. The gate clanged closed. Somewhere in the distance, a cricket chirped. Sophie pulled on the sleeves of her pale yellow tunic, glad Bayana was also dressed casual. Though Bayana's turquoise tunic 
had pink beaded flowers embroidered around the edges in a pink satin sash. So what are we going to do? Bionna star stared at the scrub as she shrugged. Okay. Is your family around? Bionna's eyes narrowed. I knew you'd ask that. What? I know you like my brother. What? Please. It's pretty obvious. He's my friend. Sure, she liked him, but she didn't like him like him. This was a bad idea. Bionna grabbed her arm to stop her from walking away. Wait, I'm sorry. It's just girls always use, use me to get to my brother. I guess I sort of expect it. Sophie could imagine how annoying that, that might get, but still, that's not what I'm doing. Did you invite... And you invited me over, remember? I know. Viona stared at her hands, wringing her fingers so tight it looked painful. Can we maybe start over? Sophie bit her lip. I guess we can try. Viona exhaled and seemed relieved. Good. Her eyes lit up. I know. We can give each other makeovers. I have all the serums to change our hair color. And we can try on some of my mom's gowns. Wrestling the Verminian would would have sounded more fun but sophie could couldn't think of a polite way to say that fortunately she didn't have to makeovers keith scoffed behind them you girls sure know how to have fun maybe you can braid each other's hair and giggle about boys while you're at it <laughs> sophie spun around to face him and she felt her heart flutter when she noticed fitz standing next to him keith grinned Actually, maybe that last part is a good idea. You could get the dirt on Foster. Find out which guys make her part go pitter-patter. Um, that would be none, Sophie insisted, hoping her face wasn't as bright as it felt. Hey, that's what they all say. But deep down, girls always have one guy they can't take their eyes off. Isn't that right, Fitz? Why are we talking about this? Fitz complained. Keith shrugged. Just saying. What are you guys doing here? Bionna asked, shooting Fitz a planned look. We came to see if you guys want to play Base Quest. What's Base Quest? Sophie asked, grateful for the subject change. Only the most awesome game ever. I called Foster for my I called Foster for my team, Keith announced. Jealousy flared in Bionna's eyes as Keith wrapped an arm around Sophie's shoulders. Sophie shrugged away from him. How about we play boys against girls? Fitz explained the rules. One team guarded its base while the other team launched a raid. If the questers made it to the base without getting tagged, they won. Light leaping isn't allowed, but special abilities can be used, Fitz added, looking right at Sophie like he was saying it for her benefit. That's not fair. Sophie and I don't have... Bionna's voice trailed off when Fitz shot her a warning look. Fine. But... You guys have to quest first. Sophie chose to be sentry at the vivid red tree they depict at their, as their base. She didn't like being the last defense, especially considering how fast Fitz and Keith could run. But she didn't know the grounds, so it made her more. It made more sense to let Bionna try to hunt them down. Plus, if abilities were allowed, she knew how to keep the tabs on the boys. Tyrkin had taught her how to track where thoughts came from. Most telepaths could only isolate a general area, but Sophie could nail down the exact spot. She'd never tried it on moving targets, but it was worth a shot. So as soon as Bionna ran off, she opened her mind and listened. Fitz's thoughts were softer than ever. He must be trying to block her, but Keith's were loud and clear. He was thinking about the lake, so she listened in that direction and instantly felt their presence. She couldn't think of a better way to explain it. Even Tiergan didn't understand. Her mind somehow touched them through the air, telling her exactly where they were. She needed a tremendous amount of concentration to stay connected as they snuck through the meadow, but she didn't lose them, even when they dashed into the forest to slip by Bionna. Her head ached, but she held on, following them through the trees. When their thoughts focused on the base, her heart thundered. They were closing in. She took off, not sure if she was seeing with her eyes or theirs, as she plowed through the trees. She didn't know where she was or how long she ran or if she felt anything, until her hands connected with skin and her vision cleared. Fitz and Keith stared at her with wide eyes. She gripped their arms. 
How did you do that? Keith demanded. You ran straight to us like you knew where we were. I heard you. Heard us how? Keith cocked his head, glancing at her hand on his arm, then back at her. Hiding something, Foster? She probably heard you crashing through the bushes like a Sasquatch, said Seth, coming to her rescue. I think the whole world did. No, I don't think that's what it is. You're just mad because you lost, Bionna teased, catching up with them. I can't believe Sophie tagged you both on her own. She can be my base quest partner anytime. She grinned, and Sophie couldn't help smiling back. She was actually having fun with Bionna, of all people, who would have guessed. Did my eyes deceive me, or is that Sophie Foster? Alden asked behind them. We've missed you around here, Della added, rushing over and wrapping Sophie up in her arms. Sophie sank into the hug, swallowing the emotions rising in her chest. She hadn't seen Alden or Della since she moved to Havenfield, and she hadn't realized how much she missed them. She took a deep breath to clear her head, and her nose tingled. Well, you smell like smoke. Is there a fire? Della glanced at Alden as she pulled out of the hug, backing a few steps away. Alden cleared his throat. Just something we're looking into. No reason to worry. And Sophie pressed aside. No reason to worry seemed to be Alden's favorite words. Then again, he'd never found anything suspicious about the San Diego fires, or if he had, it hadn't been important enough to hit the gossip circles. Sophie was sure Morella would have heard otherwise. So what are you guys up to? Della asked. Getting stomped in base quest? Keith grumbled. You should have seen it. Sophie tagged us out like she knew where we were. Alden glanced at Fitz, who gave the slightest nod before he grinned at Keith. It sounds like someone's not happy about losing. I'd just like to know how she did it, but she insists on being all mysterious. Keith narrowed his eyes at Sophie. She still hasn't explained how she slammed Fitz into the wall yesterday. Sophie flushed, and when she met Alden's eyes, she could see clear concern. Fitz said he was going to talk to you about that, she said quietly. And any theories? None that makes any sense. A second of silence passed. Then Della came to the rescue. Besides, we girls never reveal our secrets. How else can we keep you boys on your toes? <laughs> Sorry. So who's staying for dinner? She glanced at Sophie. Sorry, I told Adeline I'd be home. Maybe next time. She flushed when she realized she'd invited herself over. Sounds good. Um, that's what Bison said. Sounds good. Do you need to use the Leap Master? Alden asked. No, Grady and Adeline gave me a home crystal. She held up a long silver chain that hung to, to her waist. The crystal pendant, pendant only had a single facet, the path to the Havenfield. To Havenfield. They'd given it to her that morning, apologizing for not giving her one sooner. She really felt like family. Don't stay away too long this time, Alden told her. We've missed you around here. I've missed you guys, too. I'll see you soon. On Monday, Bionic, Keith, and Fitz sat with Sophie at lunch. Jensen and Morella kept giggling and staring at their visitors, Morella especially. Dex spent the entire lunch sulking at his tray. Hey, Dex, Sophie said, trying to draw him out of his funk. Can you come over after school today? He glared at Fitz before his eyes met hers. You don't have any other plans? She ignored his snipe. I was hoping you'd tutor me in alchemy. I'm going to need help before midterms, and you're the best alchemist I know. Dex straightened up a compliment. Sure, if you really need me. Keith wagged a finger at her. Aw, don't get go getting good at alchemy, Foster. Who else can we count on to destroy Lady Gavin's capes? <laughs> don't worry, I don't think Sophie can ever get good at alchemy, Morella told him. Do you have any idea how many things she's exploded? There have been other explosions? He flashed Sophie a wicked grin. This I have to hear. Sophie sighed as Morella filled everyone in on her almost weekly explosions. Now she had a reason besides Bronte to get better at alchemy. If sitting with Keith was going to be a regular thing, she would never hear the end of the jokes. Keith got detention a week later, so she was off the hook for the teasing. But it was a lucky break because even with Dex's expert instructions, she couldn't get the hang of alchemy. 
She almost caught her room on fire twice before Dex moved their practice experiments to the caves that lined the beach at the base of the ha of Havenfield's cliffs. Rock couldn't burn and the ocean was nearby if they needed it, and they needed it a lot. She even caught Dex's tunic on fire. <laughs> She's really terrible at alchemy. Maybe it was because the rules of alchemy defied every rule of chemistry she'd ever learned. Or maybe it was because the ingredients were so foreign, but two weeks away from exams, she was panicking. Her only chance of passing would be if she knew what would be on the test so she could practice until she got it right. Too bad Lady Galvin refused to give a study guide. Sophie was fairly certain she was hoping she'd fail so she'd be rid of her. Of course, Sophie could always read her mind. Ugh, I gotta blow my nose. The thought was so terrible she was ashamed for even thinking it. But no one would ever know. And she'd still have to complete the assignment for the test without any help. Narrowing down what this, what to study wasn't so wrong, was it? Plus, if she didn't pass, Bronte would have what he needed to get her expelled. Maybe even slipped off to, shipped off to... She refused to finish the terrifying thought. The fear made up her mind. At her next alchemy session, she dropped her books. She kept her back to Lady Galvin as she bent to retrieve them. And before she could wimp out, she closed her eyes and concentrated on her thoughts. It was easier than she had planned. Lady Galvin had the exam on her mind, so Sophie didn't have to probe deeper into her memories. She was deciding between making Sophie turn a rose to iron or make her turn brass to copper. The hardest basic transmutations. Sophie tucked both ideas away, then closed her mind and picked up her books like nothing had happened. She'd expected to feel triumphant. Now she had a fighting chance. Plus, she was right. Lady Galvin was giving her the hardest challenges to try to fail her, and she'd thwarted, thwarted her plan. So why did she feel like she'd eaten a huge bowl of slime? Distra <laughs> Distracted and uncomfortable, she spilled the gash rooms and made the whole room reek of rotten fungus. Study hall was worse, so everyone poured over their notes while Sophie sat frozen, afraid to open her books. By the time she got home, she was on the verge of tears. She couldn't touch her dinner, couldn't hear the concerned looks on Grady's and Edeline's faces. She didn't deserve sympathy. She didn't deserve anything. She hid in her room the rest of the night. Sleep was a lost cause. Alone in the darkness with a snoring imp shattering the silence and Ella in her arms, she forced herself to admit the truth. She'd broken the rules for telepaths. Or even worse, she'd cheated. Just thinking the worst made her skin crawl. From now on, anything she accomplished at Foxfire would be because she cheated on her alchemy exam. Could she really live with that? No. But what could she do? How could she study without focusing on things? And if she didn't study them, she'd be sure to fail. It wasn't like she could tell Lady Galvin what happened. She wasn't allowed to tell anyone about her telepathy. She had to cheat now. No one, no, no way around it, unless... Her heart sank at another option, as another option occurred to her. It was far from ideal, but it was her only way out and better than living with guilt for the rest of her life. Fear weighed her down as she crept out of bed and dug out the imp harder Alden had given her, but she had to do this now before she changed her mind. She cleared her throat, took a deep breath, and forced her lips to say three words she was dreading. Show me Alden. Chapter 26 Dame Melina's office was a triangular room with glass walls and a high-pointed ceiling at the ape of the pyramid at Foxfire. Morning sunlight streamed through the clear windows, but every other pane was a mirror tilted at just the right angle to show Dame Alina's reflection as she sat behind her mirrored desk, examining her hair from all sides. Sophie kept her eyes on her hands as she confessed her crime. She didn't want to see the disappointment on Alden's or Tyrion's face or Dame Alina's reflections glaring at her from every direction. This was so much harder than telling Grady and Eveline before she felt left for school. They'd just nodded, forgave her, and hoped she didn't get into too much trouble. What do you think, Dame Alina? Alden asked when Sophie finished. His voice was neutral, not angry, but not gentle either. Dame Alina pursed her lips. She violated the ethical regulations of telepathy. She did indeed. 
Tarkin murmured, and I'm sure some here feel she should be exiled for that. He glared at Alden. Sophie froze. Would the council exile her? In here, she thought all she was facing was expulsion. Alden sighed. No one is suggesting anything of the sort. Sophie released the breath she'd been holding. Right, because it would be absurd to exile an innocent girl, but a man with a family to care for. I will not have this argument again, Tyrion. It was the council's ruling. I had no choice but to obey. There's always a choice, Tyrion insisted quietly. Sophie knew they were talking about Prentice, and she knew she could, she should be curious, but ever since she realized he was the one who'd abandoned her, she didn't want to be interested in what had happened to him. It hurt too much to think about. Now, now, boys, Dame Alina said, ri rising from her chair with an elegant flourish. She smoothed her hair and her dozens of reflections. Can't we play nice? No one said anything. Dame Alina sighed. Then she turned to Alden, flashing a wide smile. What do you think the punishment should be? Tyrion snored. Yes, let's leave it up to him. Why bother asking her telepathy mentor how she should be punished for violating the rules of telepathy? He's the one reporting on her to the council, Dame Alina argued. Sophie had to stifle her gasp. Alden was reporting on her too. How closely was the council watching her? Yes, everyone knows he's good at that, Tyrion growled. Alden sighed but said nothing. Don't forget your place, sir, Tyrion. Dame Alina said icily. As long as you are a mentor, you will respect my authority, and I'd like to know what Alden advises. Of course you do, he said under his breath. Everyone knows how you favor him. Excuse me? Dame Alina hissed. Alden closed his eyes, shaking his head, but Tyrkin straightened his shoulders like he wasn't backing down. It's hardly a secret that you tried to stop his wedding to Della. Really? Sophie blurted, unable to stop herself. Dame Alina flushed bright red, and her mouth flapped a few times like she wanted to speak but couldn't get her tongue to work. Alden ran his hands through his hair. All of that is neither here nor there, isn't it? Tyrkin asked. This whole process is pointless. Sophie won a pardon from the splotching match. Can she hand that over and consider it punishment served? And allow her to believe that cheating is tolerated? Dame Alina huffed, still struggling to recover her dignity. Certainly not. But she didn't actually cheat, Tyrkin pointed out. And the fact that we're here at all tells us she regrets it. She didn't have to confess, Alden added. Tyrkin stared at him for a second like he couldn't believe they were on the same side. She should, st she should still have to serve detention, at minimum, Dame Alina insisted. That's ridiculous, Tyrkin argued. Can I say something? Sophie asked, a stunning Stunned by her sudden courage, her mouth went dry as they all turned to stare at her. I'll serve the decision. Seeing how she'd disappointed everyone made her ill, she didn't deserve to get off easy, and the smile hiding in the corners of Alden's mouth told her she'd made the right decision. Dame Alina nodded. Good. Then I'm assigning you detention until the end of midterms, and you are not to tell anyone the reason you are being punished, is that clear? What will you tell Lady Galvin? Sophie asked. I'll explain I'll explain the situation to her, no reason to worry. The warmth in Alden's voice melted the sickening guilt in her stomach. It wasn't a perfect solution, but at least she'd be able to sleep at night again. Well once she stopped worrying about her midterms and Bronte, one problem at a time. It was becoming a theme in her life. Where are you going? Dex asked when Sophie turned to head away from the cafeteria, so much for her plan of slipping away unnoticed. She stared at her feet. I can't sit with you guys today. I have detention. Detention? They all repeated loud enough to turn a few heads. How long do you have it for? Dex asked. Till the end of midterms, she mumbled. The end of midterms? Jensi whistled. Dude, what'd you do? I don't want to talk about it. She gave a small smile and bolted before they could ask more questions. The detention hall was in the glass pyramid, one floor beneath Dame Alina's office. The ceiling was low, and the windows blocked more light than they let in, giving the room a gloomy atmosphere. Sophie tried to sneak in without being seen by twenty or so other kids, but Sir Conley recognized her from their elementalism sessions. Welcome, Miss Foster. 
he announced, and Eri had turned her way. He brushed a hand across his long, dark hair and waved toward the rows of uncomfortable dust. Take a seat and settle in. I have quite a treat for everyone today. She ignored the stairs as she sank into the first empty chair. She caught Keith's eye from a desk in the corner. He grinned and gave her a thumbs up. Ready for more siren song? Sir Conley asked. Everyone groaned. You have no appreciation for art or nature, he grumbled, clapping his hands. An ear-splittingly shrill whine, part whale song, part nails on a chalkboard with just the right amount of screaming toddler reverberated through the room. Uncover those ears. I am broadening your horizons, and you will listen to every note. Everyone glared at him as they lowered their hands. What are you in for? Keith asked with a crooked smile. Somehow, he'd slipped into the empty desk behind her. None of your business, she whispered. He laughed. You keep claiming you're not mysterious, but who are you kidding? She sighed. What are you doing here? Remember the reek rod someone put in Dame Alina's office a few months ago? That was you? Of course. Took her long enough to trace it back to me. He laughed. Not even a little repentant. Will you at least tell me how long I'll get to enjoy your company here? She bit her lip. To the end of midterms. Sounds like Miss Foster did something very bad. In the future, you should leave the mischief be making to me. Sophie cringed as a shrill whine rang through the air. Is it always this loud? Oh, no, that's just Sir Conley. Tomorrow it's Lady Belva. What's her brand of torture? You'll see. Ballroom dancing. That was Lady Belva's idea of punishment. Given the choice, Sophie would have taken the screeching sirens any day. <laughs> but not me. I'd rather do the, bell, uh, the ballroom dancing. <laughs> the desks were shoved aside so the dances could be done in a line like at old Edwardian balls. Keith tried to grab her as his partner, but Lady Belva claimed him for herself and paired Sophie with Valen, one of Jensie's greasy ponytailed friends. His palms were cold and sticky and a blob of drool settled in the corner of his mouth and never went away. Keith snickered every time it was her turn to promenade through the other dance dancers on Valen's, Valen's sweaty arm. She had never been so happy to hear the bells chime at the end of lunch. I hope you know Valen is in love with you now, Keith teased when he caught up with her in the hall. And you would know that because, please, you could see the stars in his eyes all the way across the room. They shine brighter than that blob of spit on his lips. <laughs> She couldn't help laughing. You're terrible. I know, he grinned wickedly, but I'm serious. I bumped his arm on my way out the door and he was crushing hard. The Sophie Foster fan club has a slobbery new member. <laughs> she opened her mouth to argue when she caught what he said. Wait, are you an empath? He winked, reaching for her hand. You want me to tell you what you're feeling? She jerked away. Thanks, I'll pass. Too bad I can read what you're feeling even without physical contact. His voice had sh shifted up a few octaves as he fanned the air. I hope Keith's right about Valen liking me. Guys who drool are so cute. <laughs> Will you keep your voice down? She hissed, glancing around to make sure no one was within earshot. Keith laughed. He fanned the air again. Hmm, now I can tell you're embarrassed and a tiny bit irritated. You're wrong. I'm just irritated. Nah, you're flattered. He scooted away before she could shove him. They walked in silence for a minute before Sophie's eyes dropped to her feet. Could you really feel that I was irritated or were you guessing? You looked worried. You wouldn't have something to hide, would you? A secret crush, maybe? Never mind. Forget I asked. He cracked up. It's almost too easy to annoy you, you know that? She sighed. Oh, all right. If you must know, yes, your emotions are a little stronger than others. I can't really understand what they are, but I can feel them. And no. <laughs> I don't know why, in case you're going to ask. It scored me major points with my empathy mentor when I told him, though. She wasn't quite sure what to say to that, so they walked in silence until the hallway forked and she went left at the same time Keep turned right. See you tomorrow in detention, he said with a smirk. It's Lady Galvin. Hope you're good at irony. It probably wouldn't be good to burn more holes in her capes. He was calm before she could ask him if he was joking. 
Keith wasn't joking. Lady Galvin brought an enormous stack of capes for the det detained prodigies to iron and hang at their punish as their punishment. Sophie wasn't allowed anywhere near them, forced instead to sit alone in the corner while Keith winked at her and Valen stared and drooled. She wasn't sure which was worse. She spent most of the time glaring at the level on her nexus, which still hadn't increased. Despite practicing leaps with Grady, he kept telling her to give, give her brain time to get used to it. She was learning an entirely different way of making her mind work, but it was still annoying. She flipped the nexus over so she couldn't see the meter anymore, and her eyes found the sparkling aquarium stone. Her mind wandered automatically to fits. Someone cleared his throat. Sophie locked eyes with Keith. She turned away when he raised one eyebrow. It was a coincidence, she told herself. There was no way he could feel what she was feeling from all the way across the room. No impasse were that powerful. Still, she kept her mind on mundane things until the bells chimed. Oh, Miss Foster, Lady Galvin called when she was halfway out the door. How's your studying going? Her mouth went dry. Good. Glad to hear it. You're going to need it. She nodded and turned to leave. You might want to brush up on iron for purification, she added quietly. Sophie spun around. Iron purification? In case you've been wondering what to study, your exam will be in that vein. Even you should be able to handle that. Lady Galvin waved her away, and Sophie left the room in a daze. Did she really tell her what would be on the test? Did she really pick iron purification, the easiest transmutation in alchemy? How was detention? Gus asked when she found him at the walkers. Good. She's dead, still struggling to wrap her mind around what happened. Actually, it was better than good, but he was looking at her like she was a freak, so she didn't elaborate as she traded books. Hey, Dex. Yeah? Do you think you can help me practice iron purification this weekend? Oh, I should probably start clocking in, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that was the end of chapter 26. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed uh, your time with me reading Keeper of the Lost Cities. I am still going to continue it. Um, I'll probably try and read a bunch more tomorrow. Like, I'll get up early, um, like at 8. And that way I can read for like a full, like, two hours or something. Hopefully we can get this done, people. <laughs> because it needs to be done. I'm on... Oh, crap. I'm on page 259 now. So... And there's how many pages in this? Went too far. How many pages? There's four hundred and eighty eight pages. So hopefully we can get this done soon. Anyway. I hope you like this video. If you do, please give me a big thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed, please click that subscribe button and click that little bell notification down below to be notified when I post and if you want to see more content like this. And I will see you guys in the next one. Later.